Hi, and welcome to NetDevOps Live. My name is Hank Preston, and I will be your host and presenter today for Important Python Skills and Techniques for Network Engineers. I'm actually calling this part one because as I was putting content together, I realized that there's actually far more important Python skills and techniques for engineers than I could fit into a single presentation. So I expect we may see me back with this topic in later parts where we'll cover additional pieces that are there. Now, before we get started or as we're getting started, please help us track the interest in NetDevOps Live topics and conversations like this by going to DevNet using the cs.co slash ndl short link. We'll go ahead and drop that in the chat window as well. And this helps us make sure that we are delivering content that's interesting to folks that are out there. And so please join us up on DevNet and this is a great link to use to get started. Now our topics for today, I've broken up the suggestions and tools into a group of different pieces. We're gonna start out with a look at better coding and style related to sharing code with other developers that are there. We're gonna to touch on topics like the shebang line, doc strings, linting and code style, as well as a little bit on the licensing piece. We're then gonna move into making our code more reusable and look at capabilities built into Python related to functions, modules, and packages. And we'll touch a little bit on objects and how those fit into this entire story as well. And then from there, we're gonna jump into making our code more robust, trying to prevent errors from happening in our code before they happen and so that we can go through. In that area, we're gonna look at using exception handling with try and accept, how we can test for proper uh, expected values and status codes, as well as creating CLI scripts and CLI tools out of our automation scripts that we create. So lots of good material we're gonna cover. As always, all of the code examples that we're gonna be looking at are shared up on GitHub, and you can find them in the links that are available in the slides that will be posted shortly after this session up on NetDevOps Live as part of the webinar resources for today's episode. During today's session, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A panel built into WebEx, uh, the WebEx application. I've got Mr. John McDonough manning our Q&A panel for us today, and so he'll be there to help you answer questions about the content or DevNet or any other pieces that are out there. The first one that often does come up is, when can I get the slides? Will this recording be posted? The answer is absolutely. Within a day or two, I should have this posted up on um, NetDevOps Live for live streaming, along with all of the downloads for the code samples and links to relative learning labs and sandboxes that you can use. Now, before I jump into the content, just a couple of notes about my own code and different pieces you might see out there. Um, not all of my code examples that you might see today or that I post in other areas follow every single suggestion that's here. And there's a variety of reasons for that. First, sometimes I build a code example for a very specific reason or a specific concept. And so it doesn't make sense to follow um, all coding best practices or work them in because it may take away from the specific code example or the specific concept that I'm trying to demonstrate. Often, I just haven't gotten back to doing a full cleanup on my code yet because code is always evolving. Right? We're always updating our scripts. And in fact, I would say that you never are done completely with a code example that's out there. And so a lot of these examples and best practices we'll talk about work their ways into my code as I go through iteration and evolution. And I'd expect the same thing for any of the code that you write. The first draft of that code may not have all of the cleanliness and best practices and comments that you want to. And it kind of gets added as you build and add on to that code. On to our first uh, topic area here better code style and sharing concepts that are out there. How can we make our code easier to share for the other folks in our community? And we're gonna start off by the concepts around making our code executable. And the idea here is we write a script that we wanna take advantage of it, and we wanna be able to let people just run the script directly without maybe having to type Python and then the script name that's there. And there's a few things we have to do to make this function for our code. The first piece is using something in Unix that's called the shebang line. And this is the first line in a script. And this isn't just for Python scripts. This is for any type of script you might use on kind of a Unix or Linux or bash type of interpreter. And it's called the shebang line because of that use of the, um, the hash symbol and then the, the, the exclamation point, which is often called bang when we talk about that in there. And what that shows us in that first line right there is it's identifying the actual program and interpreter that your computer is going to use to run this script that's there. Now in this case, you can see that I'm using user bin env python. 
Now, if you've seen other code examples, you may actually have seen a shebang line that looks like this, user local bin Python. Now, the reason I always recommend the user bin ENV is this actually leverages the active environment that you have going with Python. The difference being if you've turned on a uh, virtual environment using a specific version of Python, by leveraging this one here, user bin ENV, your script will run using the Python interpreter that's currently active. If you leverage user local bin Python, then when your script runs, it's going to hard code to whatever is usually considered the default version of Python on your workstation that's there. Most times, we don't actually want to use that default version. And so using user bin ENV is a great standard way to just put Azure Shebang line to make sure you're targeting that active virtual environment in Python. Now, using the shebang line is not enough to make it so that you can execute a code example directly. You also have to make that script executable by adding the X flag. And you can do that through bash with chmod plus X. Once you've added that in, now you can run your script right here with just dot slash example1.py, and it will run that script as it goes through. And this is a great way to take your scripts and kind of start turning them into actual kind of utilities that you may par um, leverage in other places. And we'll see several other examples of how we can make our scripts turn into these types of command line utilities that can go into your arsenal as a network automation engineer. Now, the next piece that I want to talk about is kind of something called doc strings. Doc strings are kind of built in documentation and help information about the scripts that you create. And you can attach a doc string in Python to just about anything that's there, from the top level file down to any function or object that you create. And you identify and create a doc string by using triple double quotes. And so I've blocked it off here in the red box. So it has to be the first statement in whatever you're adding the doc string to. So in this case, it's the first statement in my entire file, triple double quotes, example Python script, that's our first line. And then we down here, we see I've just inserted a copyright line, but this is where you could put some dialogue about what this script is for. Now, doc strings also can go into functions. So right after we define a new function, we can see inside here, we're saying the function that says hello to somebody. What is this function all about? And again, it has to be the first line after the start of that um, object you're labeling with the doc string. And the use of triple double quotes is part of the Python standard for using these. Um, triple double quotes are a, a way to create multi-line strings inside of Python code as it goes through, heavily used for those, but in this case, it's being used specifically to create a doc string. Now, doc strings are leveraged in a couple of different places. There's kind of a built-in variable to every Python module or execution that's going through called double underscore doc double underscore. And if you haven't run into it yet, that's often uh, kind of verbalized as dunder doc. And so the doc strings become the value of the dunder doc automatically. So you can access that actually within your Python code. And you can also find the doc strings inside of help output. And so if you import in a function or you're running a function, if you run help on that function in this example, say, say hello, uh, say underscore hello, you would actually see the doc string come back as part of that. So let's actually take a look at a couple of these pieces kind of live in code. So I'm gonna switch over here and find that code example. So right here, I've got my example Python script. This is the same one we were looking at. And we can see that I've got my double, uh, my doc string is identified here. And then each of the functions also has the doc string. And then I've got my uh, shebang line at the top, and it's probably hard to see across the WebEx because it's grayed out in Atom here, but user bin env Python. And so in my code window, if I change into the proper directory, let's see if I can find that script. So here's example1.py. If I look, python-v, python-v, I'm running Python 3.6.5, and my current Python is inside of a Python virtual environment, specifically virtual env standard bin Python. And that's different from the default Python interpreter that uh, my Mac is using is on that side. Now, once I'm in here, I can also see that I have added that executable flag to the script. And so this means I can run this file with just example1.py and the script runs. And it's just a simple kind of uh, hello world style script, printing out the current directory, what my internal user ID number is, and then some other information that's here. 
Now you may wonder, it's executable, why can't I just type example1.py? We can see command not found. The reason is that unless this directory where example one is located is listed in the path environment variable, you always have to indicate the directory where you're running the script. And since I'm in the directory, dot slash indicates the current local directory and then example one.py to go through. The path variable is one of the environment variables that are used across in, um, operating systems. And we're actually gonna talk a bit of, more about environment variables later on in the presentation today. But if I look at what the current settings for my path variable are, we can see there are a series of directories, including my virtual environment directory, bin directory, as it goes through. And in fact, that's what Python does when you activate a virtual environment, is manipulate the path is one of the pieces that it does so that you execute things using your intended version of Python. All right, so with that, let's switch back and move into our next piece, which is where I wanna talk a bit about requirements files. Now, if you wanna share your code and have other people on your team, or even other people through GitHub that find your code through GitHub or CodeExchange run those scripts, it's really important that you include a requirements.txt file listing all of the Python dependencies for your script that's there. And the use of the, the file name requirements.txt is kind of a, a standard that is developed across the Python community that's there. Now Python dependencies are any of those other modules that your code relies on. And so here we can see this requirements.txt file has a list of different requirements. So Ansible, Genie, IPython, Napalm, NC client. And we can specify very specific versions that we know our code or our script needs or has been tested with by using the double equal sign. Or you can see there's also greater than an equal and less than an equal so that you can hone in on specific uh, versions of that software that's necessary for your script to go. And you generate that again with pip freeze and then the greater than symbol in this case is a redirect symbol that says take the output from pip freeze and then just put that into a file called requirements.txt. Very simple to package up those Python dependencies in a requirements file in this way. Now moving from requirements, I wanna talk a little bit about style and code styling. So PEP8 is the style guide for Python. It's where all of kind of the, the standards across the Python community for how you actually create style um, and how you should write code as it goes through. And now a quote out of the style guide, we can see here it says, the guidelines provided are intended to improve the readability of code and make it consistent across the spectrum of Python code. And it's important to recognize that style, coding style is not about, is, it, is not syntax. Syntax is, did you write proper Python code? Would it execute successfully? Code style, again, as it says here on the slide, is about readability, making sure that if somebody else picks up your code and tries to go through it, they don't have to fight through trying to understand kind of just the, the way that the code looks. It's best practices about whether we use spaces versus tabs, where we put um, how many lines, uh, how many empty lines do we put around pieces? Do we put extra white space in different areas? Again, the things that don't change whether the code functions, it's about the readability of the code and the way it looks. And PEP8 is kind of the, the main style guide for Python. Many enterprises and, and coding shops may have kind of their own um, changes to the style guide for different languages as it goes through. Now, when you think about styling, one of the, the capabilities in software development or one of the words you may have heard is this concept of linting. Linters are programs that look over code and look for different types of things like syntax errors, bugs, or style as I've highlighted in blue. Um, and kind of compare the code source code with what those standards are. Now, Flake 8 is a, a, a linter for Python that kind of aligns to that PEP8 standard. And you can install Flake 8 with pip, so pip install Flake 8, and then you can run it against your code and see how well it applies, or how well your code um, aligns with the Python style guide. So here we can see I've run Flake 8 against example one, and then each one of these entries on the output indicates an area where example one, that source code, doesn't align with the PEP8 style guide that's there. And so we can see here, error 302 is, um, relates to blank lines. PEP8 expects you to have two blank lines in a place and it only found one. 
down here I've got some spacing problems around different equal sign. And so Flake 8 outputs and reports all of the errors, and then you can go through your code and fix these errors so that you align to the PEP8 style guide. Now you can do that manually, but that can be very time consuming to go through, and it's not always the best use of the developer's time. I will say, if you do it manually, you will find yourself writing better code over time anyway. So there is some value at kind of understanding what these changes are. But most developers, myself included, have actually moved on to code formatting tools. And there are two code formatters for Python that I like to leverage myself. These are black and white. And what a code form formatter does is it looks at source code and then changes the look and feel, changes how it works to align to some standard. And black and white align your code to the PEP8 standard. The difference is black is kind of the base code formatter and it's called the uncompromising Python code formatter, and it will align your code nearly to everything that's in the PEP8 piece. But black allows you to kind of change the default line length, and the default setting in black is not to PEP8 standard. And so white was actually developed, it's another package that's available up on PIP, and it was designed by the same developer that does the requests library, that REST API HTTP library that I'm sure many of us have used, White was designed by the same engineer and developer. And what White does is it runs black against your code, but also makes sure that your line lengths in your code align to the PEP8 standard of 79 characters as it goes through, and will automatically format your code appropriately. And so we can see here, if we want run White, it says reformatted example, all done. And now when I rerun Flake 8, there are no errors, which is why we see no output that's there. This is an interesting one to actually see live as well, so I'll flip back to my code. All right, so I'll clear my screen. And so this is that example one. If I run flake eight against example one.py, I get a series of errors. So in the output here, this first number eight is the line number, and then this is the character that it's in there. So at line eight, um, character one, expected two blank lines. So if I go and look, right here, we can see that I have a single blank line. The PEP8 standard says that before the definition of a function, there should be two blank lines. So if I add a blank line, save the file, excuse me, rerun flake eight, we can see that that line eight is now gone. I fixed that error, and now on 14, it's talking about spaces around an equal sign. This is about right here. We can see I've got name, space, equals, space, name. Well, this functions, works fine, but PEP8 standard says that we shouldn't have spaces there. And so I can fix those, save the file again, and we can go through and see those errors are now gone. Now again, I can manually do that, or I can use the code formatter white and run white against example1.py. And if you watch the code over here when I run this, it will automatically reformat it, and it starts to insert lines and spaces and fix all of the things that didn't align to the piece that's uh, in, didn't align to PEP8. So now when I rerun Flake 8, we can see that most of the errors are gone, but line 18 still reports too long. That's this line here, and we can see that it, indeed it is a very long line, and white wasn't able to automatically fix that for me because it didn't want to break something in my code. But because it's triple double quotes, I can simply add a carriage return in here save the file so now i'm less than that 79 characters if i rerun flake all my mistakes or all the style mistakes are now have now been resolved as they go through all right done with that example let's go back to our slides now just real quick about licenses i included it here because i think that as we write our network automation scripts and we share them up on github many of us may not have a good idea of kind of how that open source or what the expectations are we may actually think if we put anything up on GitHub, it's automatically open source code that's there. And that's not true. You have to actually include a license file with your code to indicate what is the license attached. Are you giving people permission to use your code examples as they're out there? Now, I am not a lawyer, and even if I was, I'm certainly not your lawyer, so it's always best practice to consult the legal department in your own organization to figure out what the policies related to open source code sharing, licenses to use are, um, but the advice I want to give is it's important to include a license if you do want to share your code as open source. 
Because as far as GitHub's concerned and the way that it functions is if you don't attach a license to your repository, it's not actually, um, you're, it's, there is no license attached to it, which means people can't use your code even if you wanted them to. And so you need that license file in the repository. Now, if you're working on a project on your own and you don't necessarily have to go talk to corporate, corporate legal, a great resource is choosealicense.com. They have information about all of the common open source licenses, what they offer, how they differ as they go through, and you can answer a couple of questions about what your intentions are, and it will help you hone in on the proper license for whatever your project is as it goes through. All right. Moving into our next section of examples here, we're gonna talk about how we can make our code more reusable. And the idea here is we wanna kind of start to apply that dry principle that we're gonna be talking a lot about this season in NetDevOps Live. So more reusable code. So functions is the first piece, and first piece we're gonna go through. And the idea around functions is we wanna stop repeating code that exists that out, that's out there. And I find myself doing this all the time when I sit down to try to code and solve a problem at the same time. Is that as I'm developing my code, I write, or write developing the script to solve some project or problem, I write a bit of code and then a little bit later I have to do that same activity. So I rewrite that code that's out there um, as it goes in. And then I rewrite it again, maybe a third time. And so here on the slide, we can see an example where I had to go make an API call off to Cisco DNA Center. What I've got in here is I've written a, a couple of lines of code. What's the URL that I'm gonna request? Use the request library to get that URL and then pull out the piece of data for the source host from that URL. Then I need to do the exact same thing, but now it's for the destination host. So what's the destination host URL? make another API call using the request library, and then again, the destination host and pull it out of the body. Outside of the fact that the IP address for the source and destination will be different, it's the exact same code that's there. Now it might often seems very simple to type this out the first time as you go through, but what if there's something changes in the API call, or if I find there's a better way to accomplish this? Now I've gotta make these changes, in this case, in two different places in my code, Whereas if it was in a function, we wouldn't have to. And so if we take this bit of code and we look at it, what it would look like if it was inside of a function, we can see now I've defined a function using the def keyword. So def host list creating my function. That function takes in a couple of parameters. What's the DNA center address that I'm gonna connect to? What's the ticket or token we'll use to authenticate? And then the IP address that we're gonna go ahead and look for the information about that host. I then go through and use that and return back the response information that's in place. Now I can simply recall that function twice, once for uh, source host and once for destination host as it goes through, making it very simple to reuse that code. Now that I've written the function, I could make, take advantage of it two, three, four, five times inside of the script, making it very easy to go through. Functions are a great way to start making your code more modular and reusable as it goes in. <clears throat> Answering a quick question. All right, so the next piece kind of builds on that concept of functions. And now we're gonna move in um, the next step in refactoring to talk about modules in Python. Now a module for Python is simply a file. So when you hear the word Python module, what we're talking about is some file that ends in .py, that's your Python script. And so we can make as many Python modules as we want. In fact, every Python script you've written is probably technically a Python module. What I wanna do here is actually take reusable or take the elements that I may need to reuse across different scripts and code and put them into their own module and then use the import capabilities with Python to bring those pieces in and use them when I need them. Now you've already been using import for lots of other things in your code, I'm sure. Maybe you've imported requests or import date time. Now what we're gonna be doing is importing our own pieces. And so here we can see from DNA underscore, or DNAC underscore resources, import DNAC. In this case, that would, this would be the information about our DNA center controller. Then I've got from DNAC functions import the list of functions that we know how to use against Cisco DNA Center. 
Now the goal here again is I may need to, for example, log in to my Cisco DNA Center in Python across any number of Python scripts. Now by putting them all centrally into a single module called DNAC functions, I don't have to include that function in all of my scripts. Furthermore, if I need to update that function, I only need to update it in one place, not all over in every single script file that I write. And so you can bring and do this type of refactoring. And the word refactor in this case is just take, the idea here is we take code that works and then we just change it a little bit to make it more readable, legible, organize it a bit better, make it more efficient. Refactoring really is going back to existing code and, and fixing it or optimizing it in some way. And so now we're gonna refactor by pulling our functions and putting them into a different module so that we can pull them in. Lots of good things we can refactor, login functions, device details, things that we wanna centralize as they go through. Now, once we've refactored them, kind of what this looks like for us is that we've created, oops, actually I went one slide ahead. Let's actually see this one in action and then we'll look at the next one. All right, so over here, I'm gonna look at my modules example. And so my modules before, if I look here, this is where I've gone ahead and I've said, okay, I've got my entire script located in one file. And so here at the top of the script, I can see that I've got a dictionary called DNAC and it has the details about one of the DevNet sandbox always on uh, Cisco DNA centers. And then I've got my functions. Here's how we log into Cisco DNA center. Here's how I gather the host list and so on. And if I scroll to the bottom of this file, way down here, this point here, line 246, is where my script actually starts. The logic parts actually start. So the first 244 lines of this script are all things that I can refactor into other files. And so what I've done now is I've taken and created DNAC resources, which contains the dictionary that has the uh, how to connect to my Cisco DNA Center, as well as the headers dictionary for the headers for the API calls. And then the DNAC underscore functions that has um, all of the functions that we talked about. So we can see the uh, DNAC login function, the host list function. So all the functions are pulled into these files. And so now my uh, script simplifies as it goes through. My logic for my script now starts on line 20, so much uh, shorter script overall. And I simply use from DNAC resources, so that's the file that has the dictionaries that are there. I'm gonna go ahead and import DNAC, that's the dictionary with the connectivity information for my controller. And then from DNAC functions, I'm gonna import DNAC login, host list, all the pieces that are there. And so with those done, I can actually execute this one. So if I change into the proper directory, modules example, I can go ahead and say, let's run Python modules after, and then I've got to give it a source and destination. It's a, a little troubleshooting script. So 10, 10, 20, 83 and 10, 10, 20, 84. Those are my source and destination. And so we can see it's running my troubleshooting script and then gathering information about these hosts from the Cisco DNA Center controller. Now the output of this function is exactly the same whether it was before I refactored into a module file or after because the goal wasn't to change the functions, it was to clean it up and make the script more readable and legible. And we can see now my script that used to be over 300 lines long is now just over, or not even quite 100 with all of the logic for what's there. And if I wanted to write another troubleshooting script, I could just simply import in the functions and resources and take advantage of them in my next script without having to rewrite them as they go through. Now the use of functions first and then modules is the, the starting bit for this. Taking this an even step further is when we get into something called packages. Now we talked about when we talked about modules, we said modules are files. It's really a Python file. When we talk about packages in Python, what we're talking really about are folders. A Python package is a folder that has a collection of related Python modules inside it. And so we use packages, or you can use packages to organize your own code. Now it's quite simple to take what you used to do just in kind of separate modules, separate Python scripts, and move them into packages. Step one, create that folder. And so over here we can see that in my directory I've got a new folder called DNAC. We're going to create a package called DNAC. And then the contents of DNAC, 
we, we see our DNAC functions and resources files, the two that we were just talking about in the modules example. Now I've moved them into their own dedicated folder. Now the bit that's new is this dunder init.py. Now again, that double underscore is pronounced dunder. So dunder init.py is a required element when you work with packages inside of Python. It has to be named like that, and it's meant to initialize the package and make resources from the package available when people import that package in the pieces that are there. Now, it sounds complicated, but it's actually really quite simple. The contents of the dunder init file are actually here in the blue box, and it looks very similar to what we did when we were importing the module directly. We can see that we've got from DNAC resources, import DNAC, and then from DNAC functions, import the functions list. The new bit here is that dot that's at the beginning of it. The dot is because we're importing from the same directory where the init file or the dunder init file is located in. And so the dot in typical fashion indicates current directory. And so we're saying from current directory, DNAC resources.py import dnac and then from current directory dnac functions.py import a list of functions that are there so really very simple to create that init file as it goes in now when we've moved from modules to uh, packages our import statements simplify even further and so now in my script i can simply import from dnac and then I can go ahead and import both the resources, in this case, the DNAC controller information, as well as all the functions that are there. One simple import statement, um, or one simple import, and then bringing in everything that's there that we wanted. Let's take a look at this one with the code itself and kind of run it, because it might be easier than we, we see here on the slide. All right, so let me close some of these files. And so I'm gonna switch over to the packages example directory and so what I have, and that atom's a little small, so we'll look at it. We'll do kind of a combination terminal here as well. All right. So I have in my this directory, here's my host troubleshooting script. That's what I actually want to write. I want to write a script that lets me troubleshoot some elements of my network. And then I have a package, remember that's just a folder, called DNAC. And if I look inside there, we can see that I've got my DNAC resources and DNAC functions. These are the exact same files we looked at in the modules example, but now we've just moved them again into the directory. And then we've got the dunder init.py. This pycache folder that gets snuck in is where all where Python's doing some optimization at runtime. So we never have to worry about those pycache folders, but that's what it's there. It's just uh, the compiled optimizations and bits. But this dunder init file, if we look at that file, we can see again, I'm simply using the from import syntax. So from dot, again, dot is just the local directory. So again, from this directory we're in, and then the DNAC resources module, again, that's just a file, import DNAC, that's the dictionary. And then from dot DNAC functions import, and then just the list of all of the um, functions that we're importing that's there. So this sets up the, the package for us to use and so now when I look at my troubleshooting script, my import statements vary, um, it's just from one package. So from the DNAC package, import the DNA center controller information, the login function, the host lists. So we've now evolved our troubleshooting script and further simplified it so that I don't have to track where are my, where are my resources are stored, what module are the resources in, what module are my, uh, my um, functions located in and broken up. And in fact, I could actually break up my functions into different kinds of purposes within the package, but still simply import from the one package that's there. So it's all about readability and making them function better. And again, if I run my troubleshooting script here, so I can go ahead and say, where is it? Oh, no, it's named different. So we'll say, okay, name of my script here is host troubleshooting. So Python host troubleshooting. And then we're again using source and destination addresses. It's the same example code. So 10.10.20.83, 10.10.20.84. We fire this off and it's that same troubleshooting script running the same pieces. So we're off of our source and destination. It's connecting out to Cisco DNA Center, getting information about the source host, the destination host, 
all of the bits that the script is intended to do as it goes in. So it's the same script from the beginning, back when it was all one file with all of the code kind of buried together. We then moved into functions. We then saw how we could take the functions and refactor them into modules. And now we've gone from modules and pulled them into packages. Modu modules, again, those are files. Packages are directories as we go through. The whole goal of this, again, is to make our code more reusable and package them up as it goes in. Now there's one more step kind of in this evolution of our code, in this evolution of, of refactoring, and that's moving into objects. I've labeled this on the slide as a bonus because frankly moving from module or moving from packages up into objects may be something that you um, if you're just getting started with Python you're not quite ready for. Objects aren't complicated but they do add some new pieces to it and so this may be something that you just know that's there and you'll evolve to in a little uh, over time as you become more sophisticated and confident in your coding. But as I was covering the rest of them, I felt it was important to talk about kind of how objects fit into the same evolution. And so let's go through those. What an object is inside of Python is it's a way to combine together methods. And so methods refer to like functions, things that we're accomplishing, as well as properties. And so the, I've been calling our properties resources, just information that we want. And what an object does is it combines the functions and the resources together into a single thing that you can code and reference against. Now the whole point of using objects, or one of the points of using objects, is the fact that the goal is to simplify our code. And this is an area where it may not seem like it's actually simplifying your code as you're getting started using and building your own objects, but trust me a little bit that as you dive into it deeper, objects can really simplify your code as it goes through. And a big reason behind that is when you're using an object, there's no need to repeat your uh, elements that are related to that object. And so let's look at our example here. When we're not using the object and we're leveraging the functions, and in this case, we're importing in these functions from our package, I have a function called host list that connects off to a DNA center controller to get information about a host. Every time I call the host list function, I have to tell it, which DNA center address and what the token is so that we can then get information about the source IP address. And so those are repeated pieces of information because the function, when it's outside of the object, doesn't have context about the other p bits of information about Cisco DNA Center. And so we can see when I use it for the destination host, we're sending in again DNAC host for the address and then token for the authorization token. Now, if we contrast that to when we're leveraging it with a uh, object, here we initialize a new DNA center object. And so I'm creating DNAC equals DNAC, so all caps in this case indicates that that's the object name. Uh, and that's kind of a, a unwritten rule for Python sometimes as developers will use all caps for object names or at least caps for object names. Inside parentheses are the details about this Cisco DNA center. So I've got the address, the port, username, and password. So now I have an object called DNAC that has a method called host a list. So DNAC dot host list. And now all I have to pass in is the IP address that I want to get the hosts about. I don't have to provide the function, the DNA center address or the token, because the object DNAC already has that information. It's all packaged together as it goes through. Now this is one that may be easier. Again, we'll go, we'll take a look at the code a little bit. And so now when we've moved from packages to objects, I'm just switching directories here. What I have is my, I've created a new class. This is how we define a new object called DNAC. And then this init function, dunder init function, is where it actually sets up all of the characteristics about this new um, object that's there. And so we can see we're taking in the address for the DNA center controller, the username, the password, the port, and creating object properties. That's what this self.address is. So for this instance of the object itself, its address is whatever we've specified, username, password, port. We can also see in the init function, we can go ahead and we can use the login function that's built into the object to obtain a token so we have that ready to go when we want to use other functions like the host list that we've been looking at in some of our examples. 
as it goes through. Now, I'm not going to go super deep into the code here because as I mentioned, moving into objects from modules or functions is a bit more of a step up, but I at least wanted to show kind of how we end as we go through. All right, moving right back into our slides, we're actually going to move into our final section of suggested tips here. And the first one is making our code more robust. And so helping kind of uh, make our code more bulletproof, so to speak, as it goes through. And so what we have here is the first bit is I want to talk about exception handling. An exception, an exception in your code is anytime you try to ex or Python tries to execute something and it didn't work as expected. And you've probably seen things like these tracebacks in your own code as you've done some development. A traceback is an indication from Python that some error happened and then it provides you all of the error details, exactly what error came up. In this case, it was the key error. Key error is an error indication when you try to access um, the key from a dictionary or some other object that's key based and that key was not found. Now the reason that we want to do exception handling is that we, if we run this script or if a user runs our script and they get this type of output, that's not very user friendly. Um, that's kind of intended for a Python developer to look at and understand what went wrong with the code. What we want to do is provide better user output when these types of errors happen because errors will happen in your code. Even if you're a prof even professional developers sometimes have problems and code doesn't work exactly as expected. And so if you can put some exception handling and give a better user experience when a problem happens, your users will be happier, even if the user is just yourself. Some things that you might want to do exception handling are um, start to relate to things that kind of touch outside of the code itself. And so if you're doing an API call, that's a great place for something to go wrong. Maybe the device that you're making the API call to is down currently, or maybe some of the authentication information is incorrect. So API calls are great places to do exception handling. Anytime you're expecting something from the user, always expect something to go wrong. Users are notorious for providing input that isn't actually accurate or doesn't align with what your expectations are. So those are, that's another great place to put it through. Now the way that we do exception handling is using kind of a workflow called the try accept blocks inside of Python. And so here what we can see is I've put in a couple of try accept blocks. This first one is going to is using and making the chat um, is a try accept block wrapped around an API call. In this case, a request for a specific type of uh, API endpoint. And so it could happen that we try to make this request out and we can't reach that device. We could get a connection error. A connection error when we're trying to connect to an API device could indicate an incorrect address. And so we can see if we get that connection error, I'm going to print a statement out to the user that says unable to connect to address, provide the address that we're trying to connect to, and then exit from our script. Now it's really important that we exit from the script here because if I'm unable to connect in this case to Cisco DNA Center for any reason, the rest of the script probably won't function. So we don't want the rest of our code to go through, which is why we exit. We give it a value of one in here because the, if we don't provide what's called an exit code or exit uh, value here, the exit code will default to zero. And an exit code of zero is kind of indicates a successful, um, indicates a successful execution of that script. And so we don't want to indicate a success. And so if we pass anything other than zero to the exit function, that will show that there was some sort of an error or failure as it goes through. So exit one is just saying we exited and there was a mistake that was there. So the other piece here, we have another try accept block where in this case, I'm looking for the token. The token should come back from a successful authentication. And we can see if we get a key error, it means that there was no token found as it goes through. So now by using the try accept blocks, if I run my function here with try and we give in this case an inaccurate um, password, we can find out that we get a much better error message than key error. We get a no token found in authentication response and then we get authentication failed, please provide valid credentials. A much more helpful user error than the key error that by default popped up as it went through. Now related to try accept for exception handling is the next tip, which is to test return data and your status codes early. And the, idea, the kind of the fundamental piece here is this top bullet point. 
It is very bad practice to assume anything when you're building your code examples. Things will not come back exactly as you expect every time. And a great motto here again is that trust but verify, right? We wanna think that we're going to get back, but before you assume that it's there, go make sure that you actually got what you thought you got. For example, if you make an API call, verifying the status code that comes back from that API call is a great idea before you go start to process the return data. And so if you're making a REST API call, looking for a status code of 200 is a great idea. If you're working with NetConf, making sure that you get that OK flag is a great idea as it comes through. You can also verify that the keys exist in dictionaries before you um, go through. And once again, if something isn't right, use that exit function with a non-zero code to indicate something went wrong. So in the code example over here, we can see if response.statusCode does not equal 200, again, a 200 would be a success, we wanna go ahead and print out an error message, login uh, request failed, status code of whatever, response body, and then we can go ahead and even send out the response text, which likely has some sort of an error message or might have some sort of an error message that we can go ahead and send to the user as it goes through. So now let's go ahead and we can take a look at this as well. So if I switch back over to our code, all right, so I'm gonna switch to uh, exception handling and first the we'll look at the with try. And so here's where we can see our accept pieces. So I've got my try block, I've got the accept block. So if we're looking for that connection error, and then we can see status code piece that we're checking for the status code to come back. And so if we run some examples here, so clear, change into my exception handling. And so if I run python with try.py, and then I believe this one uses, yep, this one needs arguments. So DNAC is uh, sandbox uh, dnac2.cisco.com. User name is uh, devnet user. And password is um, cisco123. Uh, and of course, they're not right. Oh, they're just positional. All right. Same code example formatted in different ways. Let me go ahead and fix this. Doesn't actually have the keywords. So with try. So here, now I've got the pieces. So this one fires off. This one was successful. We got a token back from our authentication. If I pass in an incorrect password, we can see my error comes back successfully. This is a much better way to go through than what the default behavior would have been. And so if I don't use the try, I'm gonna to switch to the without try version of this. We can see that we get back that key error. So this error message is something that we don't want to uh, have our users have to see and deal with. This is a much better response to come back and kind of show. And we've done that with just a little bit of exception handling and some status checks. All right, let's go ahead and come down to the end with the last couple of examples here that we've got. So in this case, I wanna talk a bit about making your script into a command line tool by providing an argument. And we've seen some examples of my, uh, already today, of me of using command line arguments as part of my script. Now built into Python is a tool called argParse. It comes with Python and it allows you to create our command line arguments that are either positional or optional and kind of using keywords. And so here we can see I'm importing an arg parse, creating a new argument parser, and then adding a couple of arguments, dash dash host to indicate the name of the host we're gonna to connect to, and then dash dash port. This example is actually moving on from uh, Cisco DNA Center to using a, dev, or a device level API with NetConf, just for something a bit different. And so I've got parser add arguments for the pieces. Now what's nice about using something like argparse to build our command line utilities is it does create some help information for us. And so we execute our command like this, argparse underscore example, and then host iOS XE management, port, what port number, username and password. But if we don't know those off the top of our head, we can pass in that dash H to get options that are there. Now we can see a note in here, uh, 
if you're making more advanced CLI tools, there's actually another library for Python called Click that kind of builds on top of this for much more robust command line tools. But if you simply want to provide command line scripts building on top of a script you've already built, argparse is really great for that as well. Now I'm combining into this next example, command line utilities for passing in information like hosts and part and username and passwords, but also talk a bit more about environment variables. Now I mentioned environment variables earlier in today's webinar related to kind of the, uh, the path variable that was there. But in this case, we're going to create our own environment variables. Environment variables are available in all of our operating systems, Linux, Mac, Windows, just about everywhere. And it's a way for running programs to inquire for dynamic information from the environment, basically from the, the computer, the session that that application is running in. And the use of environments and kind of manipulating our applications dynamically is part of something called the 12-factor app. 12-factor app is like a manifesto for software developers giving best practices for writing uh, uh, cloud-native or modern applications. And this separation of configuration information, things like IP address, host name, passwords, from the actual code is one of the parts of the 12-factor app. And so for us, we don't want to bake in things like our IP addresses or our um, usernames and specifically passwords, that secret information, into our code scripts. We want a way to kind of pull that out, make it more portable. We've seen using command line arguments in the last example where we could pass those in, but we can also use environment variables for that. And so here we can see I'm exporting, exports the keyword to create a command line argument on a, a Unix or Mac or a bash type of a terminal. Set would, is be how you would do that in a Windows terminal. So in this case, I'm exporting username and password to create new environment variables for those. And then my script can go ahead and read the username and password in, and I don't have to specify it as a command line argument that's here. And we can see in my code up above, I'm simply going through and using the OS Python library dot get env to get an environment variable with a keyword of username for that. And with that in place, we can actually run this code and execute it for our final demo today. So let me switch back. We'll find that code first. So command line tools, our parse example. And so down here within the code, we can see now where I'm creating my arguments. So host and port. Username and password are optional arguments. We can see required is set to false. And then if they haven't been passed in, we're gonna go ahead and look in the environment variables for them. Let me change over here. Arg parse example, and we need to give it a ho. Well, first we'll do the help. Dash H for, H for help. We can see this is the help message. So it shows me the usage. Arg parse example, dash dash host, and then dash dash port. We can see dash dash port surrounded in square brackets to indicate that's optional as our username and password, but I have to specify a host. And so if I go ahead and run this, we'll say dash dash host is, uh, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit so that I don't have, to, I can remember what it is. Switch back to our code. It wrapped a little weird. So host here is iosxemanagement.cisco.com. That's one of our sandboxes. And it happens to run netconf on port 10,000. So we switch to that. So I'll go ahead and run that one off. And we can see I get an error message that says I have to provide the username or password either as a command argument or as environment variables. And so in here, if I go ahead and create export username equals root, I already set the password one. And so if I do env, which will let me access the environment variables, and I'm just gonna grep for username. We can see, here's the one I set. I've also got another one set, but username is there. And then if I do the same thing for password, we can see that I also have a password environment variable. So now those are available. And so when I rerun my command line, my script here, our parse example host iOS XE management, and then give it the port, it should now run. And if our sandbox is up, we should get back what's called, uh, just get back the route list. I'm asking for the route list using um, netconf, and indeed I did. Very simple route list, just some connected in a default that's there. Now, if I wanted to specify those and override the username and password, I could simply go username, oops, username, and then give it the username, in this case it's root, 
And now I could override the environment variables by going through. Again, making our scripts more usable and portable as they go in. All right, coming right down to the end, but I've got good timing here. So let's go ahead and end our session today. So we covered several different Python tips and techniques. We focused on things to make our code better, st uh, better styled so that it'll share better. We looked at how we can evolve our code using functions, modules, and packages, and even a little bit about objects to make our code more reusable. And then we just finished up a section on making our code more robust using try and accept uh, handling, looking for specific types of output and status, and then using CLI tools and scripts as they go through. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the topics that are here, I've assembled a lot of webinar resources. And as I mentioned, these will be linked also up on NetDevOps Live as part of the webinar resources for this episode. But you can look at the Python for Network Automation page at developer.cisco.com slash Python. If you're getting started, we've got learning labs that'll help you get your laptop set up with proper Python installed and other utilities, as well as walk you through some coding fundamentals. And then I've linked here the two DevNet sandboxes I leveraged in our webinar today, the Cisco DNA Center Always On, as well as the iOS XE Always On sandboxes. And as mentioned, all the code samples I looked at today are available up on GitHub, and we've got them posted in Code Exchange as well. And I've got a short link here so that you can find it inside the bits and pieces. Now, coming out of this, I always like to leave NetDevOps Live sessions with a challenge. So I imagine you're probably working on some bit of network automation code for some project or just in the lab. My challenge to you is to take one of those bits of code you're working on and leverage one or more of the suggestions we talked about today and then get that submitted up to Code Exchange so other people can share and leverage your work. For example, take functions that you've written and move them into modules, right? And import them back in, show how you can be more modular with your code. Or if you've got some good code that's out there, start running it through Flake and White so that you can actually clean it up and get it to align to PEP8 standard. Great ways to build on the stuff we've talked about. And as always, there's tons of great Net DevOps content that's out there up on DevNet. Developer.cisco.com slash Net DevOps is the home for all things Net DevOps related, but you can find our blogs and other Cisco or what Net DevOps Live episodes as well. And please stay in touch, both with myself as well as Cisco DevNet. You can reach me at hapresto at cisco.com via WebEx Teams or email, but a great way to follow me is up on Twitter at hfpreston. And be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all of the social medias. Thank you so much for joining me today in episode one, season two for Net DevOps Live. We're kicking off to a great start. Be sure to join us next week where we'll be back talking about your uh, suggestions for your first network automation project. We'll see you next week. Thanks.